Welcome to Don't Retire, Graduate, the podcast that asks you what you want to be when you grow up so you can graduate into retirement with purpose and passion. I'm your host and valedictorian, Eric Brotman, and we have a really special guest today. Nicole Casperson is a journalist. She's the founder of WTF, or what the FinTech. Uh, she's, it's a <laughs> newsletter that comes out twice every week. Uh, it's an industry newsletter. She serves more than 17,000 subscribers uh, and gets an unbelievable open rate. People are loving your content, Nicole. She's also the host of the Humans of FinTech podcast every week, which shares stories of diverse leaders and how they founded their companies and found their belonging in an industry that is dominated by some of the same old voices. So she's going to teach us how inspiring FinTech operators uh, have, have done what they do, especially uh, folks of color and women in the industry, which is dominated by folks who look a little like me. Nicole, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And interestingly, um, a lot of growth has happened even in the short time since we first got connected to have me join the show. And I am actually almost crossing 50,000 subscribers. 50,000. <laughs> yes. You've yes, gone so from 17,000 to 50,000 in like, I don't know, an hour and a half. A few months. <laughs> and how, yeah, Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Wow. Uh, and and I haven't subscribed yet, but I plan to. So it's 50,001. Please. Oh, so there's yes, that. Thank you. Now I can officially uh, celebrate. Anytime I, anytime I know I'm going to interview someone who's created something WTF, it makes me wonder if this is still a family show. So tell us a little bit about what the fintech, <laughs> where it came from, how you came up with it, uh, and why you're passionate about what you're doing. Of course. Uh, I'm a journalist. I've been uh, a journalist my entire career. I went to school for it. And I, you know, like most little girls, I ended up landing into the finance industry. I didn't intend on being a part of it. But I kind of found throughout my time covering a bunch of different niche uh, B2B and uh, markets in finance and being a part of a number of different trade publications, kind of two things. One, not only was the industry that I'm covering largely white and male dominated, but so are the newsrooms that I'm sitting in. And so I kind of understood or found this problem really that I wanted to help solve, which is how do we actually create a space where more representation is being shown through media, which inherently will bring more diversity into our workforce in our finance and fintech industry, which would also mean we would create more products that actually cater to and resonate with a diverse audience, which we all claim we serve. So mm -hmm. a little bit of holding the industry accountable, a little bit of wanting to make some real change, because I do think we can do a lot better and we're, we are on the right track. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how what the fintech was born. I. I Figured I could m uh, marry my loves for journalism, media, and finance and tech, and elevating women and diverse stories all in one. I, I think it's possible that we're kindred spirits. Um, I was an yeah. English major, studied English <laughs> and psychology, loved to write, um, enjoy the media piece of it, but also want to create financial literacy and platforms that reach a, a broad audience. So uh, it's nice that you're in that kind of work. I want to take a step back because I'm not sure our audience knows exactly what you mean when you say fintech. In our mm. industry, we know exactly what you mean, but I'm not sure necessarily that the general population does. So can you describe what fintech is and where that intersection is with personal finance. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, fintech stands for financial technology, and there's a lot of iterations of that uh, short form of it. There's fintech, there's prop tech, which stands for like property technology, it's so more real estate focused, or you know, health tech, which you know, healthcare. Um, so, what fintech has done is really become more center stage. Um, in our culture, in the news, in media, in the fact that I can go to the bar with some friends and they ask me things like, what do I think about crypto or what do I think about this finance technology app? So fintech really is, you know, if you engage with your finances on this thing, on this iPhone, in any way, you are engaging with fintech or financial technology. And right now, it is one of the largest funded business sectors in the world. So because it's become center stage and our culture is now really interested in it, there's kind of this beautiful opportunity for us to 
actually present fintech in a way to a more you know, mass audience so that they can have a better relationship with their money, right? A lot of it has to do with behavioral finance and incorporating that into more finance technology. Right now, fintech isn't doing the best job when it comes to enabling consumers to actually make actions that are helpful to them and their, you know, mental health and their financial health. There's a lot of access out there, but it, the, the apps right now are incredibly oversaturated. And I do think that we can do a little bit of cleaning up and um, bettering of the way that people interact with technology. Cause right now it's a little bit too much like social media in mm. that fintech apps are working to just get you on the platform for as long as possible and the engagement aspect, but we could do a little bit better. I, I confess that I've spent some time over the last couple of years on this show and in other forums um, beating up on robo advisors, um, nah. not because there isn't a place for them, not because there isn't a place for them, right. but because of what you said, the behavioral finance piece, I think it's one thing for a computer to to do some predictions, uh, to create mm -hmm. uh, to, to create some um, some hypotheticals, um, and my fear really is first, it's been gamified. So you talk about mm -hmm. creating engagement and creating some of these some of these apps give you a little gold stars for doing things like taking actions, like placing a trade, for example, which to me is not necessarily something we should be high fiving about. Maybe it's good, maybe it's not, but the gamification of finance is, it, it's been happening a long time. Cause you know, in high schools in, in junior high and high schools, mm -hmm. there's the stock market game. Um, and in mm -hmm. a lot of towns across America, there's a stock market game. And, and I contend that stock market is not really a game, though I understand that it's being done as a simulation, but it's not a game. Um, yeah. How do you, and, and I, there are companies trying to humanize the fintech piece and one of them being facet and i, I saw you interviewed mm -hmm. anders jones mm -hmm. on your show um yeah, you know, my former my former business partner is one of the one of the folks who started facet as well so I, I i know them very very well i think they're doing a phenomenal job um at crossing at creating that intersection because it's really hard to do mm. um yeah. what is it going to take to shift from that social media um, adrenaline high gamification of finance to something that can really help drive decisions or behavior in a in a healthy way, more more like a nutrition app or a or an exercise yeah. app that I think does a better job with that already than the finance. Mm, I mean, so many good points. The at the end of the day, right now, what we're seeing, especially in the retail investing space and, and fintech app space, is bringing in the same tactics and behavioral tactics that Silicon Valley and right, like I said, the social media apps, um, using those engagement tactics and nudges to bring them into finance so that people are engaging them with uh, a ton. For example, like Venmo. Venmo is like literally designed <laughs> to uh, induce FOMO, right? So you're going to see the, and actually Danny Fava just said this at an event I was at and she's head of innovation at investnet she was like venmo was created to induce fomo so that you have to see the payment interactions that your friends are doing without you there like that they didn't invite you to you know and so um things like that right like why are we um pushing for for bad behaviors when we could be pushing for good so a lot of what what the fintech is and what i report on is starting with leadership. I do believe that if we had more diverse leaderships and people that are actually representative of the uh, demographics that we're aiming to cater fintech products to and financial planning products to, right? We're all about access. We love talking about access in this industry, right? Um, well, let's actually create a culture within our industry to have leaders that can make that happen, right? You have to have diversity in the room to create real innovation. And so that's I think that's where the disconnect is for me, is that if we don't have enough different types of decision makers in the room where it happens and the products are made and the design processes are made, then we're gonna keep having the same results. We're gonna keep having these apps that don't work. We're gonna keep having apps that aren't able to marry the behavioral finance and financial planning FinTech aspect. How much of uh, personal finance do you, th do you think is, um, is cultural? How much of this, because so you talk much. about, the, I mean, I, <laughs> I feel like the, the lessons we learn about money growing up, usually not from school, 
and rarely from our parents sitting us down and teaching us. It's more like watching them fight over the dinner table about who spent what or I know. Or, or, or who's or what bills are being paid or the stress involved. Like we, we carry baggage about money when we're like five years old. How much of it is yeah. cultural and, and how do you how do you tackle that with a with an app, with a tool? Mm -hmm. Like people often ask me, like, what is my first money memory? And for me, it's like, I think it is more so like a collection of memories as a child of, you know, I'm, I was very privileged. I didn't ever have to struggle with money as a kid, but I always watched my parents talk about it constantly. Right. So you're kind of just like, what is this thing that, um, that these grownups are always so like, up in arms about and then you grow up and, and figure it out yourself but um i i do think that because personal finance is such a part of culture now and it got such a heavy hand and it's a uh, 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 frenzy with culture because largely of because of the gamestop phenomenon which i'm sure most of us know about um so that was good however there's a lot of bad consequences with that you know the access that that gamestop brought was amazing and the engagement but the kind of aftermath of how people are continuing to engage with it you know is is bad and those aren't you know mutually exclusive they both happened so now right how it is on us to be like okay well there is good enough technology technology is mature enough we can we can take some of the good of you know, social media aspects, right? And nudging and that type of thing, maybe not nudging, but like we could take better ways of doing it so that we're presenting like vegetables to people instead of just cake all the time, right? <laughs> in, a, in a way, like how do you present the healthy aspects, right? How do we help people mentally think differently about their relationships with finance? You know, we talk about like financial freedom or financial independence a lot. And to me, that actually is a, a mindset. The first step to financial freedom is financial independence, like from the mindset that money is this thing that controls me. That's not, the, the, the culture is shifting away from that. No, no, no. Money is something that is a tool so that I can live out my values, so that I can invest in things I believe in, so that I can help change the world. And that that's, what we have the ability to hone in on in fintech and financial planning and and all that so i wonder if you have the sense as i have for many many years um that the game is rigged and <laughs> what i mean by that and, and i don't just mean on the big wall street firms even the GameStop rig or the or or, or crypto or these other things where a very small number of people wind up making a very large amount of money and a very large number of people wind up losing everything um, because they're not insiders. They're not. They're and, and I'm not alleging that that's deliberate, though it wouldn't surprise me if it if it was deliberate. Is the game rigged? Is it really rigged, or is there a, a, a democratization of that information? We talk about how there's a, a free market and and public information and and you know there's no insider trading and everyone knows everything. All the information's public. Is it though? <laughs> I mean, if we think about the traditional financial system, then yeah, I mean, it's rigged and it's like filled with patriarchy and all of the things, which is interesting because that's, you know, what fintech came on the scene, right? To, and a lot of the, the mission statements now are meant to completely be the alternative of that, right? So we're supposed to leverage fintech financial technology so that we can fix the broken financial system or better yet create a new one right that uh gives that access that we want to talk about i think we have accomplished the access part i think there's even better ways of doing it especially through like you know new ways of evaluating uh, credit or like new ways of catering to the small to medium-sized business space or create catering to you know uh the creator economy and and things like that um, so we, there's still like a long way to go, but I think that the, some of the more secret sauces is also the educational aspect of it, right? Is content. Mm -hmm. I get asked about content a lot because I'm a content creator. And so how are we putting like the right content out there? Uh, you know, the 
the seeing what you your friends are investing i don't know if that's like the best use of our time that just goes back to inducing the fomo why not put actual valuable content in front of people um i think that's actually why a lot of maybe advisors or wealth managers will think well i don't need to be on social media or create content like there's the people on there are saying not like they're not saying the right thing they're saying bad advice why would i want to be on a platform where other people are giving poor personal financial advice and it's like maybe because then you would fix it like because then maybe they would listen to you and be and that and that would actually help i think there's a massive opportunity to to for financial advisors financial planners to create content that actually helps and is good to drown out some of the bad well, I, I absolutely agree with you, and I'm certainly trying to be one of those creators. I mean, we're we're yeah. pushing out as much content as we can, and we love doing that. But it's also hard to determine quality from noise, especially as a layperson, mm -hmm. where you're getting bombarded by messages. You know, I was asked early in my career when I was shifting into trying to be a content creator and writing and and speaking and these things, and and I was asked by a um, a contractor at one point who said you know, what's your end game? What do you want? And no offense to these individuals, but what I said was the world deserves better than Susie Orman and Jim Cramer. Why not me? And mm -hmm. that's not to beat on these two successful folks. It is to say that, that when you're in the media, sometimes it's about eyeballs. It's about advertising. It's about entertaining more than educating. And so when you talk about the vegetables versus the cake, if I'm promoting vegetables, it's harder to get to 50,000 yes. subscribers than if I'm producing cake. Mm, so, mm -hmm. so you've got a 50,000 subscriber newsletter that alleges to be vegetables. Um, <laughs> and I believe you, I have no reason to disbelieve you, but, but right. how, do you, how do you get people to say, okay, broccoli's good, I'll skip the cake? <laughs> Um, uh, a mass amount of authenticity and, um, and some killer, uh, growth marketing people on, on my team. So mm -hmm. I, and I have to admit that, right. I am not someone, I look very different than the other FinTech newsletters out there. And the stuff that I'm covering is makes people uncomfortable. It can, I have a ton of uh, amazing, you know, men, white men, different kinds of people, all sorts of um, folks that are incredibly grateful or let me know it, right? That they're grateful for the content that I create. They're grateful for the vegetables, with which my vegetables are largely around, right? That behavioral finance, how do we use the technology mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. help uh, for good? How do we create a culture where we have more diversity in, in the room where decisions are made? I think because I've doubled down on my message and being authentic about it and my experiences myself with the industry, that that's how you kind of grow. You know, at the end of the day, the, the way to kind of grow is it, with content organically is, it sounds easy, but it's actually quite hard is being yourself. Like, what is your personal story? If you wanna create content, like think to yourself, what is your personal story? No one can tell that story better than you. What problem do you have, right? This is just like any entrepreneur or any founder, right? What problem do you have that you want to solve? How are you gonna solve that problem through content if that's your your end game, right? So um, that's what I would think. And then how do you kind of authentically present that so that you don't, cause that's the thing. People that uh, consume content, everybody in the world, we can fish out someone that isn't authentic, right? Someone that's just doing it for the views, that's doing it for the media attention. And, you know, sometimes, yeah, those people do get the numbers, the vanity metrics, all of that. But I think we live in a world right now where there's so much room for everyone, right? Like think about how many influences there are, how many content creators there are. Um, there doesn't need to just be one or two that dominate a space. So kudos to you for putting yourself out there, right? And, and doing that. So. But as someone who looks different, I did have to have marketing behind me. I had to have a team behind me to ensure that uh, my message was clear and out there and could grow. And they did a killer job. So it was a mix of both. Sounds like it. So to be mm -hmm. authentic also means to be vulnerable. And, yes. you know, That's we have an part. intense. Well, we're, we're as human beings, we have vulnerability, some of which we are very comfortable sharing and some of which we might be a little more covetous about 
So to be authentic, I think you have to be vulnerable. Do you feel you have um, made yourself vulnerable enough to be approachable? Because a lot of times in the media, there's this tendency that you're a celebrity of some kind, and therefore you're you're unapproachable. <laughs> I certainly don't think that about you, Nicole. But are, are you? Have you been able to stay um, to stay grounded and to stay humble in mm. the, despite the fact that you're now um, you're now reaching really a mass audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think because I have always kept my original, you know, community of supporters since my I used to be a reporter at Investment News before I launched my own uh, newsletter and podcast and really the tight knit crew of people that I had met in that role, I, you know, ensured that they were down to ride with me through my next thing. And they actually loved it even more because they felt like it was a, they were seeing a, the real me, right? They were seeing the not so buttoned up version of me, the version of me that is a hundred percent authentic, but being vulnerable took, you know, I, a long time. I'm not a year old yet. My, uh, I will turn a year old in November. Mm -hmm. So it took me the last 10 months to really ground myself in my voice. I just started to get really confident to share my story and to share the things that's going on with me. It started off with me thinking, oh, well, people just want to consume my content for news like before, right? Like when I was a reporter and it took all this time and enough organic feedback from people that I trust and kind of my own like personal board of advisors to tell me like, your content's great, Nicole, but I want to know what you think. Like, I want to hear from you. I want to know what is what about these these people, this story is making you, you know, think twice or tick. And you do that enough, you do enough reps with that, and then you start to get more comfortable. So I think if you are of the belief that people aren't going to appreciate your perspective or your, you know, beliefs or your point of view, then you know, those aren't the people that are meant to follow you or be a part of your your journey or community. The people that are invested in you will be invested in you every step of the way. Like I have people who read every single newsletter, who come to every one of my happy hours events, like anything that I do, listen to every podcast, some tw sometimes twice. Like, so you just have to focus on, on those people and creating that community around you because that is what will keep you kind of grounded uh, as you continue to grow. I read investment news every week um, and have gotten to know some of the reporters, some of the others um, there and have, have been interviewed and so forth. It is very buttoned up. It is extremely conservative. Yes. Um, and I don't mean politically yeah. conservative. I, I mean, in content conservative. Um, yeah, for and, sure. And so, you know, for you to, and I'm going to use the word because it's the theme of our show, but for you to graduate, I mean, you sort of retired from, from traditional journalism and graduated into Nicole 2.0. <laughs> which is absolutely That's, awesome. So I have to ask you, what 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 do you want to be when you grow up? What's Nicole 3.0 look like? Is it is it even too soon to tell since you're barely a year old? What's <laughs> what's what's you know, what would you like to be and do and accomplish um in the next chapter of your of your journey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I you know, I think about it a lot and for me it's about creating like this content empire if you will that is mm -hmm. you know filled with other women journalists other women in the industry and you know kind of creating that uh just that powerhouse what the fintech platform that is that safe space for women and different types of people to share their stories get heard um, you know, have the connections that they maybe never had uh, an opportunity before because no one gave them the time of day. So that for me is what I want, what the fintech to be, what I create to be. Um, if I can help influence the next generation of journalists to, you know, want to come to the business to business uh, media realm, then you know, I'll have, I think I could maybe retire. <laughs> okay. uh, I don't ever want to retire, but yeah, that's kind of what I want to graduate uh, into next is, is building out the platform so that there are, it's more than just me, right? So that there are more women telling the stories of other women in this industry and then creating that flywheel or snowball effect. So we can really continue to create some real change. Nicole, you use the word empire. 
I love that. <laughs> Because that is that is not a small thing. Empire mm. um, Empire means that that you know to be a catalyst for real change and to sort of take over a space. And uh, my money's on you. I have no oh, doubt. Thank you. I, I have no doubt at all. Uh, it's going to be fun to watch you from the periphery, and uh, I'd be happy to uh, to mix some of my vegetables with yours sometime. We'll make a salad. Uh, <laughs> yeah, seriously, if some vegetable content. Veggies yes, are good, I, man. You just got to grill well, them, you know. Some butter well, it's, on there. It, it's <laughs> now you're making me hungry. All right, so but it, it's <laughs> I think it's it's important to, not only to hear the different voices and different opinions, but to have dialogue and maybe debate that's mm. civilized and healthy and professional and not vitriol. You know, exactly. they, there's a lot I, of that in this world that we could do without. Well, exactly. And for me, the content has never been about being cynical. It's never been about wagging my finger at an industry like you could do better. It's always been about being <laughs> aspirational. It's always been about what are the action items that you can take? I never write a story without action items. Like I want you to read the history and the realities of the industry, read the stats, read the personal experiences of the people I interview and my thoughts, but then see the action items that you can take right now as a leader, as an operator, as an investor, well, whoever you are reading my content. And there's stuff you can do every single day to make a difference and every single day to, to you know, be a part of the real innovation of this industry, which will be to you know, make it more like the rest of the world, like to make it actually representative of our demographics uh, that are out there. So that's how you present the vegetables a little bit. Without it being so cynical, anyone can be cynical. It's hard to be aspirational. It's hard to say, you know what, let's do it differently and, and we can and like, let's have some fun while we do it. Why not? That's why the content is meant to be fun. It's not, yeah. And it's meant to include everyone, white, male, non-binary, women, largely women. Well, I do cater that you, audience a lot, but. You have me fired up and ready to run through a wall. Like, put me in, coach. I'm doing this. <laughs> exactly. So, so, and for you to say that you don't ever write anything without an action item actually tees up the most important question, if there is such a thing today, because we don't believe in homework. My, my poor kid, my seventh <laughs> grader, has more homework than I did in 10th grade, and she's in seventh <laughs> grade. So, my gosh. But nobody likes homework, but we love extra credit. And so the extra credit today can be that actionable. What can our audience okay. who spent a half an hour with the two of us today opining about the industry in lots of different ways, what is the what is the extra credit assignment? What's the action item, the takeaway today that people can go do right now to, to either learn more or become more or be a, more aspirational, however you'd like them to be? Yeah, I would say um, before I plug some of my things, self-reflection and maybe taking a look at the team around you. Um, you know, look, look at what your inner circle looks like. If a lot of it looks the same, I would highly encourage you to maybe step out of your comfort zone and find some new folks to join the community or put yourself out there so that you're constantly learning from different types of people, because that's how you're going to be a better leader. That's how you're going to be a better financial advisor, planner, wealth manager, investor, whoever you are, is by always being like a sponge that gets to listen to all these different perspectives and then you get to self-reflect and make your own. So that's action item one. But to learn more about how to yep. do that action item one, you can yep. sign up for my newsletter. It's called What the Fintech, spelled W-T-F in tech, question mark. And uh, you can sign up on workweek.com. You'll see like a little floating head of, my, of me there. Um, and if you click on that, you can sign up. Um, I would also just sharing, I think my content is incredibly helpful. Uh, coming to my events, I host events called FinTech is Femme. And I the title may, so may be a little bit misleading, but I love when men show up to, to that event because it is an all-female speaker faculty of women in FinTech sharing their stories. And I think that everyone should hear those uh, regardless of how you identify because that's how we make our community stronger. And so showing up to my events, sharing them with people that you know, and, um, you know, tuning into the podcast. My podcast is called Humans of Fintech. You can find it anywhere you get your podcasts. And I interview largely, you know, women and uh, underrepresented folks and about the, the things that they're building. And a lot of it is a philosophical talk. Ooh, there it is. 
about, uh, you know, what was it about their backgrounds, maybe some trauma that they've experienced that has led them to create what they have created? Nicole, you've been an amazing guest. You actually stole my thunder. I was going to ask how our audience could engage with you, but I let you go because you were on a roll. <laughs> um, and and I, I do want our, I want our audience to check out some of your work because I think it's impactful. I think you've interviewed Thank some you. really amazing folks from different walks of life, which is absolutely what I consider this to have been for me this morning. So uh, thank you for being here on Don't Retire, Graduate. I wish you amazing success in your empire building. Uh, and like I said, <laughs> my, my money's on you. And if I ever get a chance, are, are, your, events are, in, are your events all in New York? Uh, not all of them, actually. I have yet okay. to announce my Fintech is Femme for the end of the year, but it is in November and it will be in San Francisco. So we're taking Excellent. it to the road, on the road. Excellent. Well, if you make it to the Baltimore, D.C. area, we will we will make sure we drum up some some earbuds okay. and some attendance for you because that would be fun. And I'd love to I'd love to get a chance thank to meet you. you in person as well. So uh, thank you, Nicole Casperson. You are a rock star and this was a great show. And I thank you for being here. I'd like to thank all of you for listening and for watching. We'd love to hear from you. So please send us a message, leave us comments at don'tretiregraduate.com or on social media, or leave ratings and reviews on your favorite podcast platform. If you enjoyed the show, share it with family and friends so they can join you in your journey to financial freedom. We'll be back next week with another installment of Office Hours and in two weeks with another engaging guest. For now, this is your host, Eric Brotman, reminding you, don't retire, graduate. Securities offered through Kestra Investment Services, LLC. Kestra IS, member FINRA, SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Kestra Advisory Services, LLC. Kestra AS, an affiliate of Kestra IS. Kestra IS or Kestra AS are not affiliated with Brotman Financial or any other entity discussed.